This video is going to be a look at the monotone convergence theorem, which is a theorem about real number sequences. So first recall that a sequence is increasing if a sub n is less than or equal to a sub n plus one for all indices n. So in other words, as we progress in our sequence, the terms, if anything, they only get bigger. A sequence is decreasing if the reverse is true. So a sub n is greater than or equal to the next term for all terms in the sequence. And then we often don't care if it's actually increasing or decreasing. So we say this word monotone to indicate that it could be one of the two. So a sequence is monotone if it is increasing or decreasing. So what the monotone convergence theorem tells us is that if a sequence is monotone and it's bounded, so bounded means that there exists a number m, so backwards z is there exists an m greater than zero, so that the size of the terms are all less than or equal to m. And this is true for every index. The sequence is monotone and it's bounded, then it has to converge. So what I like to picture is a sequence which is going up, 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 but there's a roof on it. So it kind of has to level off and tend to something, and that would be the limit of the sequence. So what we're going to do is, is look at the axiom of completeness first. This is an axiom about the real number system that we need in order to do our proof. Then we will prove the monotone convergence theorem, and then I'll give you an example of when it's useful. Our proof of the monotone convergence theorem will rely on the axiom of completeness, which I've stated here. The axiom of completeness, it's an axiom about the real number system. So this is not something that we're going to prove. We're going to take this as a fact that we agree upon. And what it says is that every non-empty set of real numbers, which is bounded above, has a least upper bound. This word least upper bound, or this phrase rather, is sometimes called the supremum. So what this is telling us is if a set of numbers is bounded, then there's a bound that you can designate as the smallest. So in particular, if uh, we look at this, the set of the terms in our sequence. So here, consider a sub n as a set of numbers. It's bounded above. So there exists some number which is an upper bound. And that number satisfies the property that it's smaller or less than or equal to every other possible upper bound. So it's the smallest of all upper bounds. This axiom also tells us that any bounded set has a greatest lower bound, so a lower bound which is greater than or equal to all other lower bounds. But what we're going to do for the monotone convergence theorem is just prove it for the case of an increasing sequence. So this is the only version that we will need. Let's prove the monotone convergence theorem, and I'm going to prove this for the case of having a monotone increasing sequence. I'll leave it to you to adjust the proof in case the sequence is decreasing. So I'm going to start our proof by saying assume that the sequence A1, A2 is monotone increasing and bounded. Since the sequence is bounded, the set, which consists of the sequence terms, is bounded. So thus the set, here I'm just switching from a sequence to a set of numbers, I'm trying to make this look like a set. So it's the set of numbers which look like the sequence terms. This set is bounded by the axiom of completeness that we just discussed. It has a least upper bound. So from the AOC axiom of completeness, let X be the least upper bound. The existence of X is what that axiom gives us. So that tells us that X is greater than or equal to every term in the sequence. And any other number which is greater than or equal to any term in the sequence has to be at least as large as x. So if I take x and subtract off a little bit, I'm not going to be greater than or equal to every term in the sequence. Okay, I did that out loud, but let me write it down now. What we're going to say is let epsilon be greater than zero.
notice that x minus epsilon is smaller than x. So it cannot be an upper bound for the set of sequence terms because x is the smallest upper bound. So, and notice x minus epsilon is not an upper bound. for this set. If it's not an upper bound for that set, that means there has to be a term from here which basically sits between these two numbers. So thus, there exists some index n. So I'm identifying one particular subscript, if you will, from my sequence so that this number x minus epsilon is to the left of that a sub capital N, this term, which I know to be less than or equal to x. That is just one particular term from the sequence, but our sequence has the property that it's monotone increasing, which means that whatever subscript this is, every index greater than that subscript also has to sit between x minus epsilon and x. In fact, it has to sit between these two numbers because we're only going to get closer and closer to x. So our next step is, as the sequence is increasing, for all indices little n greater than or equal to this one index that we've identified, we know that x minus epsilon is less than a sub n. This is less than or equal to a sub little n. That's what I'm bringing in, which is less than or equal to x because x is an upper bound. That puts a sub n, if I look at, actually, let me add one more thing too. Let me add an x plus epsilon. It's a little bit silly, but I'm going to highlight three terms now. Take this term, this term, and this term. If I just look at those three parts of this chain of inequalities I have, this tells me that um, a n minus x sits between negative epsilon and epsilon. Let me finish this over here. So thus, negative epsilon is less than a sub little n minus, or sorry, I meant no absolute values yet. I'm going to bring in absolute values in a second. But negative epsilon is less than a sub little n minus x is less than epsilon. Or in other words, this inequality is equivalent to the distance between a sub n and x is less than epsilon. Okay, so I've taken this and just rewritten it with absolute values. This is exactly what we want to see for sequential convergence. For any epsilon, so for any epsilon, let's kind of highlight it. So for any epsilon, there exists an index capital N so that for all indices beyond that threshold index, this happens. That is the definition of sequential convergence telling us that the limit of this sequence is x. So therefore, this sequence converges, and we can actually say what the limit is, it's the least upper bound. Okay, so that concludes our proof of the monotone convergence theorem. In the case of having an increasing sequence, if you wanted to prove it for a decreasing sequence, you would follow a similar thought process, but you would be looking at the greatest lower bound. One of the major applications of the monotone convergence theorem is that it's used to prove other theorems, but here's a computational application. So consider this sequence, which is being defined recursively as a1 equals 3, and then future terms are defined in terms of the previous term via the relationship a sub n equals the square root of 5 times the previous term a sub n minus 1. So a sub 2 would be square root of 15, etc. You can generate a few of these terms and notice that it's monotone increasing. You know, you can make that conjecture. You might also be able to work out a pretty good bound for it. What I'm going to do is prove that it's bounded first, then we'll prove that it's monotone increasing. Once we have those two properties, we'll be able to apply the monotone convergence theorem to know that the sequence converges. And then once we know it converges, we know it has a limit, then we can compute what the limit has to be.
Okay, so first, let me prove that this se sequence is bounded. I'm going to show that all of the sequence terms live between 0 and 20. I want them to be greater than or equal to 0 so that I can actually do this computation. And also, um, 20 is a convenient upper bound computationally. It's by no means the least upper bound, but that's okay. We just need to know that it's bounded by something. All right, so my first claim is going to be that 0 is less than or equal to a sub n is less than or equal to 20 for all indices n. So for all terms in the sequence, they sit between 0 and 20. We are going to prove this by induction. So induction is a three-step process. For the first step, we just need to verify that the very first term in our sequence has this property. So our base case is to notice that a sub 1 is 3, and 3 is between 0 and 20. Okay, so base case is usually pretty straightforward. Now I'm going to make my inductive hypothesis, where I'm going to say, imagine that some term in the sequence, I'll call it a sub k, sits between 0 and 20. So suppose that 0 is less than or equal to a sub k is less than or equal to 20 for some k. So this is one specific term which sits between 0 and 20. Given this information about a sub k, I want to prove now in my third step that a sub k plus 1 also sits between 0 and 20. So I'm going to build off of this inductive hypothesis. Then a sub k plus 1, oops, sorry, I wrote a sub k plus 1. Be careful there. It's a sub the quantity k plus 1, all in the subscript. Okay, so the next term following this uh, term that we identified in step two is equal to the square root of five times that term. I'm going to do this with both bounds at the same time. So it's greater than or equal to zero because this is greater than or equal to zero. So it's greater than or equal to the square root of five times zero. And uh, let me continue here just so I don't risk going off the bottom. A sub k plus one which by definition is the square root of five times the previous term, is less than or equal to, if we plugged in the upper bound that we made on this term, so that would be five times 20. This is why I picked 20, because five times 20 is 100. We take the square root, that's 10, and 10 is less than 20. Okay, so we proved that if you know that the kth term in your sequence is between zero and 20, then you also know that for the k plus one term. That's the beauty about induction is now we can say, since it's true for a sub one, it's true for a sub two, combining two and three. And since it's true for a sub two, two it's also true for a sub three. I'm struggling to say two and true in the same sentence. Then if it's true for a sub three, it's true for a sub four, and therefore inductively, it's true for every term in the sequence. So all of our sequence terms sit between zero and 20. Now, you might be able to work out a much better bound than 20, but again, I did this for computational convenience. It wasn't hard to get 20 as a suitable upper bound. It's not the least upper bound, but it is a bound, and that's all we need at this point. We've proven that the sequence is bounded. We need to show it's monotone. This particular sequence is monotone increasing, so that's what we'll show. So our next claim is that the sequence AN is an increasing sequence. Okay. I'm also going to show this by induction. And what I'm going to induct on is pairs of adjacent terms. So our base case is going to be the relationship between a sub one and a sub two. So proof by induction for this part as well. Where the base case is to notice that a sub two, which by definition is five times a sub one, the square root of that quantity, this is equal to the square root of 15, which is, if you want, greater than the square root of nine, which is a sub one. So this tells us that the first pair of terms has this property that we increase from the lower to the higher index. Okay, so all that to say, a one is less than or equal to a two. Let's do less than or equal to. 
now what my inductive hypothesis is going to be is that there's some pair a sub k minus 1 and a sub k satisfying that a sub k minus 1 is less than or equal to a sub k. So I'm going to make a hypothesis at about, about an adjacent pair of terms. Suppose a sub k minus 1 is less than or equal to a sub k for some uh, k greater than or equal to 2. Okay, that's my hypothesis. I want to show that the next pair of terms, which would be a k together with a sub k plus 1, also has this monotone relationship. Okay, so third and final step in our proof by induction is to notice that a sub k plus 1 is defined as the square root of 5 times a sub k, but a sub k is greater than or equal to a sub k minus 1, and square rooting preserves this inequality. So the square root of a smaller number is smaller than the square root of a larger number. So we can say that this is greater than or equal to the square root of 5 times a sub k minus 1, but then this is the definition of a sub k. So at this point, we have proven that if this pair is increasing, this pair is increasing. So we increase from a sub k to a sub k plus 1. And that concludes our proof that this is an increasing sequence. So now we have that it is bounded and increasing. We are going to apply the monotone convergence theorem to know that it has a limit, and then we'll compute the limit. Let me clear some space for that. Okay, now we can say that by the monotone convergence theorem, this has a limit, which is a real number. So by the MCT, we know that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n exists, and is some real number, which I'll name L. We can compute what L is using algebra on limits. So in particular, let me take the recursive relationship and square both sides. Therefore. What I'm going to do is say that L squared is the limit of a n squared. That's an algebraic limit theorem property. So L squared is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n times a n, or a n squared. But by definition, a n squared is 5 times a sub n minus 1. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity of 5 times a sub n minus 1. The thing is, as n goes to infinity, it doesn't matter if you call your terms a sub n or a sub n minus 1. The subscript is going to infinity. So wherever a sub n goes, a sub n minus 1 goes there too. So this limit is 5 times L, and that's actually another algebraic limit theorem property. It's the multiple. It's 5 times the limit of this. So L squared equals 5L. That means L is either 0 or 5. It cannot be 0 because we are monotone increasing above 3. I'll say and as A sub n is greater than or equal to 3 for all n, we conclude that 0 is not an option, so L is 5. OK. So the limit of this recursively defined sequence is 5. And if you crank out a few terms uh, numerically, you'll, you'll agree with that. You might think, why did we need the monotone convergence theorem? Why didn't we just jump straight to this? And the reason why we needed the monotone convergence theorem is you cannot do these limit computations, this algebra on limits, if any of these diverge. So being able to say that if a sequence, con sequence converges to L, then the sequence squared converges to L squared, that is only true if the sequence converges. So if I didn't know that a n converged, none of this would be valid. So we have to use the monotone convergence theorem in this context to first know that we're talking about convergent sequences here, and then we can do this algebra.